This is where railways as we know them were born, in the northeast. Born in the marketplace at Yarm, in a pub among the people northeastern railway men still serve today. A hundred years. A hundred years during which the railways grew and spread as the Northeast developed. Now, to meet the needs of today, what amounts to a completely new railway is being created? And the men creating it are in the forefront of changes as far-reaching as those their predecessors launched in 1825. They've got a big area to serve, 8,000 square miles of vital national activity. In the North, its boundary is the Scottish border. Down past the industries of Tyneside, it stretches, with Newcastle as its centre. On then to Teesside with its steel and chemical works. From the Pennines in the west, across to the Humber and the East Coast, and in the South, the textile towns of the West Riding. It's an area which contains some of the country's most important industries, and providing the services to meet the needs of those industries is, and always has been, a major concern of railwaymen. Take coal to start with. A lot of the region is built on top of coal fields, so perhaps it's not surprising that over a quarter of all the coal traffic carried by British Railways starts from the northeast. And inside the region, 70% of all the freight tonnage carried is coal or coke. The big power stations that keep industry going, like this one near Leeds, each mean five million tons of coal to be carried every year and industry is continually developing, creating new needs, greater demands for the handling of its products, and demanding new power to serve it. More power stations being built mean more coal to be carried. The new needs and the greater demands in turn create new traffic and call for new and better services to cope with it. This is what British Railways modernization means. This is what it's all about keeping pace with developing social and industrial demands, whatever and wherever they are. Whether it's carrying a million tons of iron ore a year from Tyne Dock to Concert, or 60,000 tons of cement in press flow trains from Hull. That's the load carried in a year, and it's increasing all the time. On T's side, from ICI's Billingham plant, Fertiliser traffic is running at the rate of over half a million tonnes a year. In fact, in the northeast as a whole, fertiliser manufacturers require as many as 200 wagons a day. The region has appointed a specialist to its sales staff to concentrate on the development of the bulk liquid traffics, including, of course, oil. About a million tonnes of liquid in bulk are carried by rail each year in the region and the volume is growing. Yes, the railwaymen of the northeastern region carry anything that pays, from tractors by the hundred from Huddersfield to cars and their owners too on special car carrier and car sleeper services. And they carry the people of the region too, of course. And this is where the most familiar new look of British Railways comes in. Just as it was first with steam trains in 1825, the northeastern region was first in 1954 with the multiple unit diesel train for local services. When the first multiple unit sets were delivered, a regular interval service was put on between Bradford Exchange, Leeds Central and Harrogate. Now, diesel multiple units are running over 10 million miles a year in the region, almost completely replacing steam trains for local traffic. 50 million passengers a year. The region's services 
exist for all of them. Regions services exist for all of them. The Transpennine, for example. A train every hour throughout peak periods of the day on important parts of the route, and timetables linked with the surrounding feeder and local services so that Hull, Liverpool and Manchester, three of the most important ports in the country, are excellently served by it, with standards of speed, comfort and cleanliness that have persuaded many a dedicated motorist to leave his car at home. And on the mainline passenger services, the new Deltic locomotives, all 3,300 horsepower of them, are slashing train schedules between the northeast and London by up to an hour, city centre to city centre. There you have the services. Better, more reliable, and more of them than ever before. How's it done? Well, for one thing, the latest signalling devices to make the fullest use of track capacity. The automatic warning system, for example. Which gives the driver in his cab an audible or visible warning of signals and what they show, even in adverse conditions like fog. Magnets between the rails ahead of each signal work the warning system on the locomotive. The driver acknowledges the warning by pressing a cancelling button and applying the brakes. If he doesn't press the button, the brakes come on automatically. The circuits controlling these colour light signals run through the track itself and the passage of the train changes them automatically. Signal boxes, too, are being modernised with the latest electronic equipment. One signalman can now do the work of many, and often it looks as though there's little left for him to do except watch the trains go by. This, of course, depends on the complexity of the section of which he's in charge, but electronic controls make it possible for him to handle a much greater flow of traffic. He's in constant touch by telephone with the control centre, of which there are seven in the region, and this one is the Newcastle control, each keeping watch over a whole area. This is how railway operating is kept flexible. The control system copes with anything unexpected as it crops up. This is the centre of a communications network which keeps contact 24 hours a day, not only with every signal cabin, but with every element of railway operating. Goods yard, passenger station, and not least, with the motive power depots where the movement of every train in service originates. As diesel electric locomotives and diesel multiple unit trains have taken over from steam, completely new kinds of motive power depots have become necessary. Since the early 1950s, Smaller outlying depots have been closed and motive power units concentrated at one or two large depots in each area. Contrast this depot at Darlington with the filthy and time-consuming servicing and repair jobs which are commonplace in a steam depot. In a modern multiple unit diesel depot, inspection and running adjustments are simple and quick. Power units are easy to get at for maintenance. When major overhauls are wanted, there's no need to take them to pieces and immobilise trains for long periods. A replacement engine, complete, can be fitted in as little as five or six hours. In the same way, the big diesel electrics can be rapidly serviced in the latest type of three-level shed. At Gateshead Greensfield, for example, concrete platforms at footplate level, the shed floor with rails raised well above it, and deep inspection pits between the rails give easy access to any part of the largest locomotive. Of course, 
Handling these machines is very different from steam, but a few weeks training and whether the drivers are veterans or comparative newcomers, they're driving the diesels with complete confidence, ease and comfort. A bit different from this, a driver and fireman both required at all times to attend to the locomotive's needs. A fire to be lit and stoked, steam to be raised and kept up. All the multiple unit diesel wants is a top up of fuel and water at the depot. One man to drive it in conditions that give him a chance to wear a smart uniform and keep himself clean. A touch on a couple of buttons and in a matter of minutes, the train's ready for action. Without the pall of dirt deposited by the coal-burning steam train, indiscriminately over men, machines and the countryside. The losing battle to keep trains clean is beginning to be won. Automatic washers like this one at South Gosford, using highly concentrated detergent sprays, can turn out 140 trains a day in excellent condition. Keeping trains clean is helped considerably, of course, by the design of modern rolling stock. At York, there is a tradition of good design and craftsmanship, famous beyond the boundaries of the region. New railway coaches are built there from the ground up, and old ones completely overhauled and renovated. Comfort and good functional design, both outside and in, and a smooth ride. A modification to existing bogies has been developed as a means of achieving this on old stock. And let's face it, some of the old stock is still pretty good. Hand in hand with services streamlined to passengers' needs, specially designed wagons for traders' requirements, for carrying raw materials in bulk, for carrying frozen foods, fruit, meat and fish. These fish vans are being finished at a works near Darlington, where wagons of a great many kinds are built, repaired and maintained. Insulated vans, vans with special interior fittings, shock-resisting vans, dry coals. There are special wide-door vans for goods packed in uniform-sized pallets, goods as diverse as chocolate and bricks. Empty vans are shunted right into the factory where the goods, once they are packed, go straight into pallets and the pallets straight into the vans. Roundtree and Company Limited have over 300 of these pallet vans in service. There are containers of various kinds, also loaded by the manufacturer in his own time in his own sidings. Picked up by British Railways road vehicles, transferred to rail, and in due course, back to road for delivery direct to the customer. The latest type, made of fiberglass to save weight, is so designed that it can be handled by a forklift truck. And for normal goods traffic, up-to-date methods of handling in spacious new sheds. In the days of horse-drawn delivery, there used to be nearly a thousand freight depots in the region handling smalls. That is, less than full wagon load traffic. With the advent of motor delivery, a thousand was concentrated into less than a hundred depots, and now it is planned to reduce them still more to under 30. This is Hull Central Goods Depot, and it's one of the most up-to-date. Radiating motor services provide the link with the trader's door. Goods which can be collected and handled as parcels traffic are dispatched in special fast parcels trains. Already, the region carries 11 million parcels a year. It's a service increasingly used by the big mail order firms, which annually send many thousands of tons in this way. From the new freight terminals of the region, like Bradford Valley Road, roughly 600 fully fitted express freight trains start every week. They're designed to provide more efficient loading and dispatch, and so make possible next morning arrivals in a large number of cities and towns, 
thus offering a competitive service which can help to relieve congestion on the roads. The wagons, whatever their loads may be, when they reach the marshalling yards, are reshuffled according to their destination. This is Dringhouse's yard near York, an old yard which has been remodelled as a hump yard with electronically controlled retarders. The marshalling of traffic for fast freight services to the south is concentrated here, and every weekday, 30 trains leave at published departure times for overnight runs to Doncaster and Peterborough, London, Liverpool and Birmingham, Cardiff, Bristol, and many other centres. Quick, accurate marshalling and overnight delivery are essential to the success of the assured arrival services the railway provides. For example, a service like Export Express, which gives an assurance that a consignment for a specified ship and sailing will be alongside in time to catch it. This service operates from over 30 stations in trading and industrial areas throughout the northeast for docks in London, Liverpool, Manchester, Hull and Goole. Modern services then demand modern marshalling yards. About five million wagons are loaded in one year in the northeastern region, and their collection in small numbers and subsequent remarshalling into trains is one of the costliest railway operations. So the big marshalling yards of the future are being built with the latest electronic control equipment. They will take the place of some 50 small, out-of-date yards. Each will serve a complete area. The Tees Yard at Newport, near Middlesbrough, for example, when completed, will handle freight traffic for the whole of Tees side. Others are being built near Newcastle, Wakefield and Leeds. All these many elements which the successful provision of railway services involves come together in the headquarters of the area traffic manager with his district superintendents. Present day services involve the movement of trains of all kinds over networks of lines so widespread and complex that for administrative efficiency they must be broken down into areas, each with a manager who has considerable local authority. In his headquarters, the particular needs of his area are assessed, plans made to meet them and action initiated to carry the plans into effect. At Zetland House, Middlesbrough, for Tees side, at Hull for the Humber and York districts, Newcastle for Tyne and Weir, and Leeds for the West Riding, the traffic manager keeps his finger on the area's pulse. He and his officers have the means for anticipating the area's potential needs and for providing the services to fulfil them, whatever they may be, wherever they may be, and whenever they may arise. The early pioneers built a railway where none existed before, a comparatively straightforward task. Today, the challenge is to convert the complex structure of the past to meet the needs of the present and the future. The new pattern is emerging, clear and well drawn.